Praise the Lord, everyone. I am Lady Janice Farmer, President of Christ Pentecostal Temple's Women's Auxiliary. Our Women's Auxiliary had the privilege of hosting a self-care session. If you are unable to join us for this powerful and enlightening session, it has been recorded and it is made available for you. I pray that this video will inspire you to create your very own self-care plan. As you're about to see, it is necessary to have something in place to prevent breakdown. If you would like a copy of our template to create your very own self-care plan, you may send me a message at ladyjfarmer at christpentecostaltemple.org. Again, my email address is ladyjfarmer at christpentecostaltemple.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Love and abundant blessings to our sister Sharon Riley Seymour, who is a licensed professional counselor and a certified clinical trauma professional. She has completed her bachelor's of arts in psychology at Wesleyan University in 2002. Her master of arts in psychology at Wesleyan University in 2004, and then completed a master of education in counseling psychology, specializing in marriage and family therapy in 2014 at Cambridge University. With over 15 years of comprehension, comprehensive clinical experience, Sharon maintains a private practice, Break Free Center for Wellness in Manchester, Connecticut, where she counsels adults and couples in all phases, in all phases of relationships. She has a passion for supporting individuals whose lives have been affected by a range of life experiences in breaking freedom, breaking free from the imposed and self-imposed limitations and hardships, preventing them from living fulfilling lives. As a Christian, Sharon believes that it's not it is not God's intent that anyone should live their life in bondage. She provides Christian-based therapy to believers seeking support. Excuse me. Thank you. Seeking support in breaking free from the strongholds and the generational curses and in navigating trials and tribulations to live the abundant lives God intends for them to live. She has an extensive training in EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and many other modalities and utilizes an integrative approach to choose interventions that best meets the needs of her clients. Let us receive our precious sister, Sharon Riley Seymour at this time. Just say, praise the Lord and give away, amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hi ladies, thank you for having me. It's good to see so many. Absolutely Lord. beautiful faces this late in the evening. Go, ladies. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Deaconess Hanley. I, it's such a pleasure seeing you and First Lady again. Um, I've had the pleasure of having um, a conversation, a couple of conversations with First Lady and also a conversation with Deaconess Hanley. So I already know the spirit of the house is beautiful and it makes me even more excited to be here today. If I'm looking to the side, I apologize. It's because when I share my screen, you guys move over. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to be here. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump right in because I wanna make sure that you get some practical tools. Um, First Lady, share with me your theme right now is growing and fervent transformation. And I thought what a perfect um, workshop or conversation to have is around self-care so that you can be intentional around that theme. And so I hope that you get something from today. And like I said, I'm gonna jump right in because even though that was a beautiful, I would have given you a shorter bio, I apologize. <laughs> Even though that was a beautiful, a lot of beautiful things at the heart, I'm just God's child and I'm just excited to do his work. And so please, um, if you have questions or anything, I know that um, there's a lot of you here, but at different points, I'll pause and ask questions. And I'm asking you to just pretend you're at church and just jump right in <laughs> and give me an answer or two. We may not have time for everybody, but um, I definitely want you to feel like this is your workshop and that you're getting what you need to get out of it. All right. 
jumping in. All right, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, um, but I just wanna give some context to why this is probably one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, and that's because scripturally, we understand that we are a three-part being and, and created in God's likeness. And so there's three parts to ourselves as a being. There's our spiritual self, there's our soul, and there's our outside body. And um, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I definitely want to encourage you guys, to, or you ladies, to be aware that when we're talking about self-care planning, this is not a one-dimensional process. We want to really make sure that we're developing a plan. And I'll share slides with you also. Uh, don't feel like, you know, be present. Don't feel like you have to write everything down. Um, but when you're developing a self-care plan, I want you to also make sure you're being conscious of plans that really address and attend to all part of your total self. And I'll tell you the reason why. Um, as Christians, we are obviously very intentional around our spiritual care. The challenge with that is that if we do that to the neglect of our physical care or even our soul work, the place where our, our mind, our will, our emotions, our ex lived experiences dwell, then it will impact our ability to do spiritual work. And so we want to make sure that we're conscious of how we're taking care of ourselves physically, how we're attending to our emotional mental health needs, and then of course, um, how we're attending to our spiritual needs as well. So I'm going to give again a little bit more context and I, I like to use this uh, analogy of a toolbox as I walk through this. And so when we talk about mental health care. I'm very big on helping under, people understand that this is, we're talking about a continuum. We're not just talking about mental illness. So people tend to get a little scared when you say mental health and that's because they're automatically going all the way to mental illness. And part of normalizing conversations around mental health care, which completely entails self-care is understanding that our mental health exists on a continuum of health to illness. And the more comfortable you get with this continuum, the better equipped you will be to listen to your body and to know where you are on this continuum. And then consequently, what you need to have in place in order to take care of yourself. So I'll use my, my analogy of a toolbox. Um, when I moved into my very first apartment, matter of fact, I was in grad school. So I was at Wesleyan, my first round of grad school. I moved to my first apartment, I was excited. And I went, remember going to the store, probably Walmart, <laughs> and getting this little beginner's toolbox. And um, excuse me, ladies. Um, and I was so excited. I was going to hang up these pictures and make my apartment all pretty. Um, and the toolbox probably had a hammer. It probably had a screwdriver, probably just one. Didn't have much in it, but it was all that I needed to get the job done. I was in a good space. The apartment was clean and well taken care of because the landlord had came in and made sure everything was in a good space for me before I came in. So I didn't need much. The hammer was just what I needed to get my pictures up. And that was all that I really needed in my toolbox. When you're in a place of healthy functioning, right? There's not much going on. There's not too many situations going on. You won't need a lot of tools in your self-care toolbox. So some simple things of just, you know, being conscious of um, your body and eating regularly, taking breaks as needed, just those simple things may be enough in terms of having self-care when you're in this space. So that was my apartment and I lived in it for a while and I'm using things and things start to have some wear and tear. And I think about my pots, right? I like to cook and cooking and the handle started to get a little bit loose. And I'm like, I got a toolbox. <laughs> so I went to my toolbox, I just happened to have a Phillip head screwdriver. Yes, I know it's a Phillip head. And pulled out my Phillip head and was able to, to tighten up the pot handle. So I guess what, I actually had the tool that I needed. And no, I wasn't in that space that I was in when I first moved in that apartment. This was just some normal wear and tear. Same things with our emotional health, our emotional health is that as we go through life, your body, your soul, your spirit just has normal wear and tear. And you want to be aware when you're in this place. Am I having just some reactivity to common stress, common life experiences that everybody has to go through? And you wanna look, is my mood a little bit off, not consistent, not over a long period of time? Am I a little bit more tired than usual? Am I noticing any fluctuations in terms of how I'm interacting with people? Am I in a state of just minor reactivity? 
um, where again, I may have some tools or I may have to go out and get, cause I had a flat head instead of a Philip head, I might have to go out and get something. Still, again, we're on the lower end of this continuum where I don't need any heavy duty tools. I might have those things in my little beginner's toolbox. Let's move forward to like the space of what I call just injury. As I go through, especially if I don't have the right tool, right? And I didn't take out my Philip head and that pot after a while, the handle can fall off, right? Or it gets so loose to where I don't feel comfortable carrying the pot to the stove. Or let's say I'm living in that apartment a little bit longer. And now I look under my sink and I'm like, what is this wet that's on my cleaning supplies, right? Might have a little bit of a leak again may just be because over time there's been enough usage of the pipes that it just caused some sign more significant wear and tear. Be aware of that when you're going through life and guess what, this is that place where there may be a significant life event that has happened. There may be um, reactions that haven't been taken care of that advance to a place of injury. This is that place where guess what, I can go under that sink all I want and take my hammer. If I start whacking at those pipes with my hammer, I will probably cause more injury than good. So this is typically that place where some of the tools you have in your self-care toolbox may just not be sufficient. You may need to acquire some new tools in this place. And that can look like a lot of different things. You may need to reach out to people. You may even need to reach out to professionals, right? So if I go under that sink and I see a leak, my hammer's not gonna work, my screwdriver is not gonna work. I might have to go to Home Depot, to Lowe's and see if they have a little kit that I feel comfortable with. And guess what, if it's me, I probably still won't feel comfortable. So I'm gonna call a professional and have them come in and take a look under that sink and fix that problem. So be aware when you're in this phase and you're having a more significant reaction, especially if there's a major life event going on, you may not have the tools and that's okay. The tools exist. You can acquire them or you can get professional help in taking care of yourself when you're in this space. Now, again, more deterioration. Now we're talking about, I never got that leak fixed. I thought, eh, it's probably nothing significant. So now we're in a place of illness where the wear and tear has gotten more significant. The unaddressed injury has now progressed to a point where I cannot touch this. This is be way beyond my scope. A hammer, a screwdriver, this little Home Depot kit, none of those things are gonna be sufficient enough to deal with this level of injury. And this is when you wanna seek some professional help. So a lot of the times, again, when we talk about mental health care, people tend to go all the way to injury and they think they wanna avoid these conversations because they think it's about getting professional help. And if there's nothing else you take away from today, it's be aware of where you are consistently on this continuum, check in with yourself. So then you can take an accurate assessment of what your current needs are. We're gonna be talking about building a toolbox, adding tools to your toolbox, but you also wanna know what tool is appropriate for what phase um, you are on this continuum. So this is where I'm gonna ask for my talk back church to help me out. When I say self-care, what comes to your mind? Anybody want to share like what comes to your mind when I say self-care? For me, I think about um, taking time away from my everyday responsibilities and indulging in things such as a massage, something relaxing, um, something to just get my mind away from my normal um, responsibilities. Thank you. Anybody else want to share something that comes to mind? Um, for me, I think of um, doing something that Annette likes to do, like shopping, okay? Taking me away from, and when I go shopping, try to concentrate on getting something for myself because I'll go shopping yeah. and buy for everybody else and don't buy anything. So I have to make myself focus. This is a me time I'm getting something for me I'm doing this for me and then I feel good then I'm, I'm you know I can go back to working with everybody else's stuff beautiful what I love about what you just said and what both of you have shared is this really it can be anything it can be the massage it can be a vacation it can be shopping self-care is really about 
one of my favorite words, my clients always tell me, that's your favorite word. It's about intentionality. It's about being conscious of the activity that I'm choosing and choosing things, whatever that is, that is uh, contributing to my emotional, my physical, and my spiritual well-being. Self-care is about acquiring tools. So there's not a one answer. And what works for me in this moment, again, thinking about that analogy, right? The tool that works in this moment may not work in another moment. So self-care is really about building a toolbox. It's about having a number of different things that's, that depending on what's going on, I can use to address my needs at the time. And so if money's a little tight and I'm trying to budget, I may not be able to go on like right now with COVID, right? A lot is going on. And a lot of the things that we typically turn to are just not an option for us right now, at least if we're trying to operate some wisdom, right? And so we want to have multiple tools. We don't want to have just one thing because then when life hits, especially unpredictable life events, like we're in the midst of right now, We want to have enough stuff that we have other things to to go to. And so even if some of those things came to your mind and they're not necessarily accessible right now, I hope by the end of today, you have some other things that you can consider as acts of self-care. So here's the thing. All of us as Christians, you know, we want to live by that let your light so shine so that um, men may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. We want to live by that. We want to really give glory to God by letting our light shine so that others can see and benefit and, and, and glorify God. Self-care is about keeping that light shining. You want to do God's work in the earth. Self-care can't be an option. It has to be a necessity. It's the fuel that keeps the light shining. And I want to, again, stress not just spiritual fuel, but physical and emotional fuel as well. So there's a couple of different types of self-care. Today, just because of the interest of time, we're going to focus on routine. So things that we can implement on a daily, a weekly, a monthly, a yearly basis to take care of ourselves. But I also want to bring some attention to the fact that there's times where our needs will supersede those routines. And so by the end of today, again, I'm hoping you have some tools and some things you're like, you know, these are some things I want to incorporate. But I also want you to know that if there's an urgent situation, someone passes away, there's um, an abnormal amount of stress of something, those urgent needs have to take precedent. And the reason I think that this is important is because we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves that I promised myself I was going to exercise every day. Well, there's times where it's okay to let those things go. And I want you to be careful that you're not judging yourself because you have to put those things to the side for a little while. Those urgent needs and taking care of you need and need specific as well as another one of those. If you're tired and you need rest, don't pressure yourself. I promise myself this. Give yourself the rest that you need. Listen to your bodies and listen to what it's telling you you need in the moment. And be okay with putting some things to the side, even if they're promises that you've made to yourself. And I know that sounds counterproductive because we think, oh my gosh, if I stop, I'll never pick it back up. You will. You'll make that recommitment to yourself. But these urgent and need specific um, moments that come up have to take precedence. So even as we're developing some routine self-care plans, I just want you to remember that when the time is necessary, be willing to put some of those, some of those things to the side so that you can take care of yourself in the way you need for those specific moments. So let's jump into some preparation for self-care planning. The first step to really developing a self-care plan is knowing what your stress level is. Um, I live by the fact that God has just designed us so beautifully that our bodies are talking to us all the time. It talks to us in how we feel physically. It talks to us in how we feel emotionally. And it definitely talks to us in how we start to behave. So even as you just look at some of the brief, some of the few examples that I have on the screen here, anything stand out to you that, yeah, you know what? I do start feeling this when I'm, when I'm a little bit more stressed than usual. Anything stand out to anybody? Oh yeah, a couple of these things stand out to me. <laughs> um, the fatigue, the headache, and I can even walk over to the behavior, procrastination, and sometimes not good enough. Yeah, that feeling. Anybody else want to share any? 
The reason this is so important to know is because every single human being on earth experiences stress. And especially when I work with my Christian clients, I try to let them know this is not about lack of faith. This is not like God saves us from sin and from the penalties of sin. He does not save us from living. So we will experience things and we will have stress. And again, I believe personally, it makes me grateful that he's designed our bodies to speak to us and to let us know, pay attention, sweetheart, <laughs> pay attention, sweetheart. You need to take care of yourself. Get familiar with you when your body is talking to you. And again, this is really referring to things that are outside of your norm. Um, I, I'm a chronic migraine sufferer, but over the course of my life, I had really bad periods. And then thank God I've been doing a lot better. So when I start getting a flare up, that's a clear indicator to me. If I have a migraine and it's lasting for a couple of days, I need to do something that can be being conscious of what I've been eating. That can be, am I getting enough rest? But that's a good time for me to check in and pay attention to what's been going on that might be contributing to some of the things that I'm experiencing. All right, so know your stress level. Know when your body is telling you that that stress level is actually rising. And then once you do that, identify what the stress is. Again, all of us experience stress. So you want to be conscious of what tends to be your common stressors, but also in this given moment when I'm seeing these symptoms, right, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's behavioral, what is going on right now that might be causing some of these symptoms? Is it overload? Is it different work challenges? Right now we're in COVID, people are working from home and they might, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's better, at least you can work from home. But it's, in some ways it's even more stressful. You know, people are working longer days than they used to. Um, so be aware what is going on that might be contributing. And this is not about a perfect science. This is really about just giving yourself the gift of checking in and seeing what might be contributing to some of the changes that you're seeing. Um, is it a specific stressor, a, a specific meaning this exact situation happened and that's when I started noticing um, health issues, work changes, money problems and things like that. So take a minute and pause when you're seeing those symptoms and pay attention to what's going on that might be contributing to these changes that I'm seeing. And then you wanna identify so this is going more, it started to go into the planning. And I would really encourage everybody to take a minute um, and really figure out what do I do now to cope? And you can do this in a couple of different ways. Um, I'll be giving you guys some packets, some, you ladies, I'm sorry if I keep saying you guys, you ladies, some packets um, that'll have some tools that'll help you with this. But this can be a quick five to 10 minute process. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, write healthy, write not healthy. And then the top, the, the top of this is, and be honest, <laughs> be honest with yourself. How do I cope with stress? I didn't think I was a big emotional eater until COVID came. <laughs> and I kept, you know, getting clients and everybody with the racial tensions in the world, everybody was really struggling. And I'm grateful to God that I'm working, but I was getting worn out. And the next thing I know, the things that I was doing to take care of myself, meal prepping and all of that, I'm like, why am I ordering out? I don't really order out. I cook all the time. I learned, okay, maybe you are an emotional eater. Maybe you do do things like that. Some people skip meals. You know, I have some clients that say like the whole day went by and I didn't eat. So you want to know not just the, not the methods that you currently do that are not healthy, but you also want to know what are you doing that's working? You don't need to change those things. You actually might need to increase them if you already know that they work and um, they've already been helping you manage stress keep them. You don't have to throw them out and just get a whole new set of things. So you want to start by just taking an honest inventory. What do I do now when stress is present? And then figure out a baseline. So you go from that, that list of what I do now. And what do you want to keep? Write those down in your, your current practices. And I like to encourage, again, to make sure that we're creating some balance, to look at the areas of mental, physical, and spiritual at the least. Some people will add things like work for work specific um, coping mechanisms and then relationships. But at the very least, you wanna look at mental, physical, and spiritual. What are the practices that I currently have in place that's working for me? And then what are some things that I've heard about, I've thought of that I might wanna try? The thing with self-care planning is 
guess what? You can try something and be like, that was not for me. So it's not about having like a perfect plan down. It's really about willing, being willing to try some different things until you find what works for you. Does anybody know or come to your mind um, any things that you're like, you know, I've always wanted to try this, but I just never, I never gave it a shot. No? Well, maybe by the end of today, you'll have something because I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff <laughs> to hopefully add to your toolbox. But think, I want you to first give yourself a chance to just think of that. Like, there, was there anything that I wanted to try and I didn't try? Um, but in those packets that I'm going to share with you, there will be um, a self-care assessment worksheet. And this is where I'm going to tell you no judgment. I want you to take that worksheet and to really look at what are you already doing well and what are you already, what are you not doing so well? This will really help you start to look at areas of deficit, right? But I would prefer it if you first take an inventory, a quick inventory before you do this, because I don't, I, you know, people will get online and they start comparing themselves. This person has this morning routine. And then it gets stressful because you're trying to mimic someone else's self-care plan. I want you to first just take an honest look at what am I not doing? What am I doing already? Um, and what do I want to keep and what do I want to add? So this will be in those packets. Use it if, if you think it'll be helpful. We're not striving for perfection. There is no such thing. Our plans, again, just like that toolbox keeps getting tools added and sometimes things get thrown out. If you strip your screwdriver, your, um, screwdriver you got to throw it out and get a new one. Same thing with our self-care plans. Sometimes tools no longer work. And so it's not about perfect. It's about just the commitment to finding things that work for you. So this, this is a weird place, but this is one of my favorite things to explore with people and that is barriers. And I'll tell you why. If you don't plan for the barriers to implementing and maintaining a self-care plan, you're not protecting that plan. And a lot of people will meet with me and they come up with things that they wanna do, but they don't think about barriers. And that just means it doesn't last long, right? So when I say barriers, there's two different things I want you to consider. What's stopping you from doing certain, like when you start looking at those areas of deficit, what stands in the way now? What already stops you from taking better care of yourself physically, taking care of yourself emotionally, or even some of the spiritual practices that you might wanna implement? What's already, what was blocking you before you even started developing a plan? And then when you start thinking about the new things you wanna incorporate, what's the excuse that immediately comes to mind? And the number one thing people will typically say is time. <laughs> and I'm gonna to touch on that because um, part of this is gonna become how to strategize and plan for those barriers so that it's more likely that you will be able to implement the plan that you want and to achieve the goals that you want. One of our primary barriers is our mindset. As long as you carry the mindset that self-care is selfish, that taking care of yourself is selfish, and I'm supposed to, I'm a mom, I'm a, I'm a wife, I'm a churchman, all these different hats that we wear, and we want to prioritize those things, you know, Deaconess Hanley, you said that, right? Like doing something for me. And believe it or not, that is hard for a lot of women. A lot of women really struggle because they feel like their purpose and their sole purpose and role is taking care of everybody else. And you want to make sure that you check that mindset because that will be the number one barrier to developing, let alone implementing a self-care plan. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. So I always think about uh, when you're on a plane, I, I definitely highly miss traveling, uh, but when you're on a plane and they tell you, you know, in the event of an emergency, make sure you put on your oxygen mask first. And, you know, most of us don't listen. <laughs> and I always say, I'm sure parents are cringing like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm taking care of my baby. But there's a reason they say that because you will pass out and you are no good to anybody else if you are passed out with oxygen mask in hand because you were trying to put it on someone else. So you want to take care of yourself so that you can be used by God to do the work that he's put you here to do. And that's whether that's in your role as a member of the church, whether that's in your role as a mom, a wife, a sister, a daughter, whatever those different roles are. It doesn't mean those roles are not important. It just means if you're not taking care of yourself, 
you will not be able to, to do those, to, to, to be in a, a vessel that can be used to do those things. So now to the actual creation of our self-care plan. I wanna strongly encourage you, and, I, and like I said, you'll get the slides, you'll also get a packet to help with this, but write them down. Write down your plan. Now, I personally, I'm a little um, <laughs> extra. <laughs> so I like daily, weekly, monthly, yearly plans. And I'll tell you how I use that. I'll actually show you my own, um, at least a part of my own in a little bit. But what is a big focus? So I know right now, growing in fervent uh, transformation, did I say it right? Yeah, okay, right? If that's the theme for the, ch for the church or for you, uh, you all as women right now, what does that look like? Don't let it just be a fancy thing that you say. What does that look like? What are practical things that I wanna do over the course of the year that is dedicated to that aim? And if you don't write those things down, they won't happen. Time will pass and before you know it, you're like, oh yeah, you know what? We were supposed to be focused on this. Um, so I always say, you can have a single focus for the year, but you also wanna look at what are things that I wanna do daily? And this sounds overwhelming, probably I can imagine, but we'll get to it in a minute. It's not as overwhelming as it sounds. Little things like eat three meals <laughs> should be a part of your self-care plan. Things like uh, drink enough water as I need to sip myself should be part of your self-care plan, right? Um, so it's not just the big things. We wanna focus on not just luxuries like our trips and our massages and all that beautiful stuff, but also on necessities. And you wanna make sure that you're creating time and space for that. So in those amazing packets I'm gonna send you, there will be templates. You can use them or not, totally up to you. You can find a million and one templates online. So the reason that I'm providing these is to save you the time if you don't want, because if you're anything like me, I would search for about a week <laughs> looking for the perfect template and then get completely lost and not actually do a plan. So um, hopefully these will just give you some things to start the process and just keep an eye out for things, tweak them as you need, steal what you want, use a notebook, whatever works for you. Another thing that I encourage people and especially women's ministries is, um, I don't know about right now, but maybe, <laughs> maybe soon, soon, Lord, soon, um, is vision boarding. I know it's become very cliche, but I do think that um, having a visual representation of what you wanna focus on can be very helpful. So with my clients, my first homework assignment for every client that I work with is to create a vision board. And the reason for that is because if you can't see yourself being the person you wanna be and having the habits that you wanna have and have a way of anchoring yourself to that on a daily basis, you won't do it. So you can also do these templates and put them somewhere where you can see them or also consider something like a, a vision board where there's a visual representation of those things and keep your, look at it every day. I'm actually looking at mine right now, but look at it every day and you can tweak it. I use thumbtacks because I swap things out all the time, um, but do what works for you. The key is just write the vision, make it plain. You want to have it written down so that it's more likely that you will, you will do it. Writing it down keeps you accountable. So back to what is self-care and what in the world is going on all these templates you're sending us. <laughs> Necessities and luxuries, right? It can be anything. Absolutely anything can be an act of self-care as long as there's some intentionality around it. My favorite word, be intentional. So if, um, let's say if, for instance, I'm not on social media, I know I'm a little, whatever. I'm just, I'm just not. But I have a lot of people that are. And a lot of my conversation becomes like, how much is too much? How much is not enough? Create some boundaries. If you find yourself comparing yourself, no one to turn it off, no one to disconnect, right? That might be something on some one person's self-care plan and not on another. So your self-care plan can be anything that is contributing to your mental, um, your emotional, your physical, and your spiritual health. So just looking quickly at these, does anybody see something that you're like, I never thought about that as self-care? I 
I see Deaconess nodding her head. I was talking to a client the other day and she was just like, Sharon, I never thought about drinking water as an act of self-care. And I said, yeah, but when you're thirsty and dehydrated, you let it get from healthy to sometimes illness if you don't drink, right? Like you can get sick and dehydrated. So even something that simple can be an act of self-care. Budgeting can be an act of self-care. I want us to think bigger picture of what are the things that'll help me flow better in my life overall? And how do I incorporate some um, structure around those things so that I'm not walking around stressed out, all right? So anything, necessities as well as luxuries. And guess what? If you're lost for things, tools to add to your toolbox, you will get a list of ideas. Um, and again, I wanna encourage you this is not about perfection. This is not about comparing yourself. Well, so-and-so said they do this. Self-care plans are to serve you. And so what happens is a lot of the times, again, people will see stuff online and they start getting, you know, that kind of envious of, wow, this person does this for this long. If it's not feasible for you, don't even entertain it. These are just ideas. And so you want to really look at your needs, what makes sense to you, and just pull some things out. You can focus on one thing at a time. Like, don't go add, oh, this looks good, this looks good, <laughs> this looks good. That equals overwhelm. So that might just be, oh, you know what? This is one thing that I might want to add to my self-care plan. This is one thing I might want to incorporate weekly or monthly or yearly or whatever it might be. And just start there, all right? So being realistic and being reasonable with yourself is an act of self-care all by itself. So let's look at mine just so that we can see how, how simple this can look. Um, I shared already, I like to create intentionality around the yearly theme that my church embraces. Um, and when I say that for me, it's what is that gonna, you know, we're in fearless, fearless faith right now. Um, what does that mean? How am I exercising and challenging and pushing my faith? And I'll create small things that I've kind of been a little scared to, to go after. And, and I'm pushing myself over the course of the year to go after some of those things. And so it just makes me be very intentional. Um, vacations, of course, again, right now, it's not, <laughs> I'm not traveling, but I like to read and I try um, to be conscious around reading a certain amount of books, both professionally as well as pleasure. So this is one of those that can, can be broken down into monthly, weekly, daily goals. So for me, if I wanna read 12 books in a year, that means one book a month. So I go as far as when I take my list and I have a book that I wanna focus on, I break it up to that means try to get through this amount of pages during the week. Now, because I like to have professional development as well as um, just pleasurable because I'm exhausted sometimes and my brain can't handle <laughs> anything else. Um, I actually started doing audiobooks because sometimes I'm just tired. My eyes are tired. I've been in front of these lights all day. I just don't have the capacity, but I still want to go out. I still want to make sure that I'm um, stick into this act of self-care because I just enjoy reading. So I started doing audiobooks and I thought I would hate it, but I actually love it. And every night I'm in the shower, there's a book playing. <laughs> Sometimes the shower gets really long because I can't stop listening. But be, again, be realistic with yourself. What makes sense? Um, and this is one of the, and First Lady, you can correct me if I'm out of order, but this is one of those things where a lot of Christians put a lot of pressure on themselves in terms of their scripture reading and their prayer life. And I just don't believe I serve a God that's sitting there watching the clock and saying, oh, you stopped too early, <laughs> right? And so we want to be mindful, even with those spiritual goals, like talk to them. But that means like you're walking around and you're just talking like just it's okay if you don't stop and actually kneel for the, for an hour. Like, again, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm out of order for how you talk to the house, but um, you also wanna be realistic. Otherwise, you won't do it. You won't do it if you give yourself a goal and an, a self-care activity, that's just not realistic for you. You know, my, my work days go very late. <laughs> and then on top of it, I'm crazy enough to be in school again. I told you guys I was a crazy student girl. Um, so 
because of that, again, I'm tired sometimes. And so that might just mean I put on a sermon and I listen and I feed my spirit that way because I, you know, getting in the scripture, like I might want to, I'm just tired. Um, so it's, I'm still making sure I'm feeding my spirit. It just may not always look like sitting and actually studying and pulling out my highlighters and all that good stuff. And so be conscious of what can you realistically do on a daily basis? What can you realistically do weekly, monthly, yearly? And your list may not be this long. That is okay. This is about you and what you need to do for yourself. Some of these things have been on here for a very long time. So they're not even, they're just here to make me keep them in place, but they don't take the same amount of effort, right? So just be conscious of that as well. I don't, this is not about overwhelming yourself. Anybody have any questions really, really quickly? I'm hoping you just see how practical self-care planning is. All right, I'm gonna keep going. So once you start developing this out, get those things on a calendar. Um, if you need to go have a physical done, you are not waiting until the day before to call your doctor and say, hey, by the way, I think I wanna have a physical, <laughs> but we treat our self care that way. Oh, you know what? I should probably put something on the calendar, block out chunks of time. So again, for me, some things I'm big on, are there spots of time where this is convenient and I can just do this even if it's while I'm doing something else. So get things on the calendar. We all have a limited amount of time. 8,760 hours in a year. And when I ask you what you probably did for the last 24, most of us are like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Sharon, let me think, <laughs> right? So this is about that intentionality again. It's, am I getting adequate rest? I wanna make sure that a certain amount of those hours is going to sleeping. I wanna make sure that there's a certain amount of hours going to this. If I have a spouse, a certain amount of time is going towards spending time with my spouse, spending time with my family. So this is really getting it on the calendar, make sure that the things that you prioritize and that are most important to you are getting done. Because we all know the phone will ring, somebody will need us, something will need to get done. And before you know it, the day is gone, 24 hours is gone. And you're like, what in the world did I do today? Sharon says to herself, Sharon, you have the same amount of time as Oprah, so you have no excuse. <laughs> she gets a lot done in her day. so you can get some things done, right? If I'm just intentional and strategic around that and schedule, then I'll make, then I can make sure that those things that I prioritize um, are getting done. Again, take advantage of pockets of time. Like I said, I'm in the shower, audiobook is playing. Two birds, one stone. <laughs> try to plan ahead, try to be consistent. When you start telling yourself, I just don't have enough time, that's a clear indicator. You need this more than anyone else. If you don't have time to give yourself an hour, if you don't have to, then you need it more than anyone else. This is not just, you wanna do it when you're healthy as well as when you're having some reactivity and you're going further up that continuum. So one of the things that I tell my clients all the time is don't wait until the car breaks down to get an oil change. <laughs> Too late, sorry. You know, you wanna get the oil change to prevent the car from breaking down. And so you wanna have self-care scheduled and on in your daily, weekly, monthly, yearly routines to hopefully prevent breakdown, all right? And now for one of my other intention, I keep telling you guys intentions, intentionality is my favorite word. <laughs> Set intentions, have a desired goal, but then most important, implement boundaries. So this is another one of those words that I think people think is a swear word is boundaries. Anything that's healthy has boundaries, anything, any healthy relationship, right? And that can just be as simple as even in my marriage, right? My thoughts are my thoughts, my feelings are my feelings. I have a right to those things. How I communicate them, I have to be mindful of, but we have a right to be individual people. That's a boundary. So anything that's healthy has a boundary. And if you're not, you know, one of the things, again, Oprah's time, right? We have limited resources. And when I say resources, I mean time, 24 hours in a day. That's not changing anytime soon. <laughs> Energy, we have physical beings. So that means we get tired, we get hungry. Our bodies sometimes ache and all that good stuff. Um, and then for most people I know, we have limited money. <laughs> That's just our reality, right? So boundaries is a way of being mindful of how you're using these resources because again you will go through the day the time is gone 
and the things that matter most to you have not been protected. You're exhausted and you still haven't eaten dinner. You still haven't spent time with your family, all that good stuff, right? Money is gone. And you're like, what, what did I buy? I don't even know what I did. So always remember, these are your resources and they are an unlimited supply. You want to be mindful of how you are spending these resources. How are you using your time? How are you using your energy? And this should help you say no to some things. Help you define what's your responsibility versus what someone else's responsibility. So this is hard for a lot of people is saying no. And just because something is urgent for someone else does not mean it needs to be urgent for you. If you take on everybody else's responsibilities and everybody else's urgent issues, then what happens to yourself? You're burned out, you're exhausted, all that stuff. And again, your things that should matter most to you, those priorities of yours haven't even been attended to. So you wanna make sure that you're being conscious of what are, what's important to me, what, are, what is it that I value and how do I create some boundaries to make sure that those things that are prioritized and that are important to me are getting the attention that they, that they deserve. No boundaries means no balance. Like literally, if you don't have boundaries in place, something will get more focused than others. And again, this is where I stress that even as, as children of God, you want a total self-care plan. Like it's, it's, we love church, we love fellowship and we love being with each other. We have to also know when it's time to go home and get some sleep, <laughs> right? Like it's time to go eat. It's time to take care of ourselves physically. Um, have boundaries so that you can be a balanced being that's prepared to do the work that we're put here to do. Have boundaries so that the things that, you, that matter most to you, you have the energy, you have the resources for. And this is when I say this, if you don't have boundaries, it's easy to let what people's will is supersede God's will. God has given us all a purpose to do in this earth. He's given us a thing, you know, things to put our hands to and to how he wants us individually to be demonstrations of his love in the earth. But if I'm so focused on what you need me to do, I'm out of touch with that. So there's things that I'm good at <laughs> that I still have to say no to because it's not what God is saying. And if I do that, I'm exhausted and I don't have the energy to do what I need to be doing um, according to, to the purpose that God has put me here for. So that's a good one is that you may be good at some things that you still have to say no to. I'm an, I'm an editor teacher at heart and I don't know how people learn that about me. So people send me their papers and can you read this? Can you, and I'm just like, how did this happen? <laughs> like when, who, who broadcasted that I enjoy editing that I am obsessed with a red pen. Um, but that just means that sometimes hours can go into reading someone's paper and restructuring and getting upset. And I'm like, I got my own paper to write. <laughs> I don't have time for this. Boundaries. It's okay if you're good at it. Not today. All right. Setting, we just finished talking about this, but setting boundaries helps you prioritize your needs over other people's wants. If you let it happen, they'll take it. It's not a problem unless you, you make it known that it's a problem. So prioritize your needs. And, and that, and to me, again, self-care plans can be beautiful. We can have all these great things written down, but without these boundaries in place that none of those things will happen. So preparing your environment. I have, a, my mouth is running a little bit dry, so I'll pause in case anybody has a question or any feedback real quick. While our sister Riley Seymour takes a sip, I'm just gonna let the ladies know that I'm preparing to put a rapid feedback, a link to a rapid feedback in the chat. So we're gonna ask, would you please just share with us um, what you have learned, what you have received, and um, that way we will be able to continue to try to meet the needs, so thank you. No problem. So this is probably one of my favorites is I probably said that every step, right? <laughs> but preparing your environment and there's two different, um, two different ways that I want you to look at this. One is just literally your physical environment. So I like pops of color and um, I don't know, I just like cute things. I don't have my mugs, but usually I have a cute mug with a saying or something. It's just, it just makes me feel good 
right? Dim light sometimes, a nice blanket. I usually have, even right now on the floor, you guys can't see this, but my husband bought me this little uh, thing that I can slide my feet in and it gets my feet get all nice and toasty and warm. And I'm in sessions and I'm hearing hard things and I'm sliding my feet and they're taking care of myself because I'm listening to hard things, right? It can be just as simple as that. How do you set your environment up so that when you're in it, it feels good, you feel good, you know? And that can just, simple things. I'm always big on quotes and framing things. I have a saying in it. You can't see them in back of me, but I have a couple of things back there. Um, something as simple as that, prepare your environment to be an environment that's welcoming, that feels good to be in. But then also prepare your environment to make those things on your self-care plan easy. So when I say that, it's like, if I want to add physical activity, I make it easy for myself. When I, I leave things out, <laughs> I don't care. I like a clean house, but sometimes I know I'm, there's going to be a late night. I'm going to be tired. I'll leave my little trampoline out. I'll leave something just so that's easy. I can just go right to it. Um, do things like that. Bible study tools, have a basket, have your Bible in there, have your notebook in there, have, have those things. So I, have your toolbox ready is what I'm trying to say. If there's things that are easily accessible, this little thing on my floor, right? It's always there. Sometimes I slide my feet in, sometimes I don't. It's always there. So make it, make your environment one that makes these acts of self-care easy. Self-care should be easy. It should not be a chore. It should not be, oh my gosh, I gotta do this. Oh my gosh, I gotta set this up. You wanna have things set up in a way that, um, gives you optimal success of actually implementing them. So one of my favorites is um, like YouTube. I'm a little obsessed with YouTube. Have playlists. Like if you want to start working out every now and then just add something there so that when I need to work out, I'm not like, oh, what do I want to do? I can just go there and pull up a video. Same thing with my audiobooks. I will typically have things already downloaded on my phone uh, that I want to listen to so that when I'm ready, it's just ready to go. So think about things like that, that you can do um, that'll make engaging and incorporating these self-care acts easy. And this goes right back to the barriers, right? If it's easy and my environment is prepared and set up for it, then that eliminates an, a barrier right away. Know your cues. Um, so I have a little saying that I say that when, uh, <laughs> when I'm need in desperate need of self-care, I'm getting a little crispy, <laughs> getting a little burned out, but you wanna start knowing what that looks like for you. What's those telltale signs? So I, I have a sarcastic side of me that usually only my girlfriends, my close girlfriends see, cause they are just as sarcastic. Um, and so we know each other and nobody's taking anything personal. We're just silly. Uh, my family's the same way. We're just very silly. Um, I don't usually show that to everybody because if you don't know that about me, I, I might hurt your feelings and not intend, or you might be like, oh my gosh, she, I can't believe she said that. So I don't usually show that side to everybody. So a good cue for me when I'm about halfway through, well, I might be a little bit more than halfway, is to the side of crunchy, crispy, is I start losing my filter <laughs> and I'll say something and I'm like, I can't believe I just said that. You know, thankfully, even now with clients, they know me enough. And I'll say something and I'll be like, yeah, Sharon, COVID has been that season. Sharon's in need of a vacation. So I start to lose my filter a little bit. I, I've learned my cue. So start paying attention. Like what starts happening when I might need to up the ante a little bit with this self-care plan. I might need to incorporate, I need to go back to the toolbox and pull out a different tool, do some new things or increase some of the things that I'm already doing. So what do I mean when I say that, when I say know your cues? What are your mental cues? Are you forgetting things? Um, do you have racing thoughts? I hear that one a lot. Like my mind just won't calm down. Physically, are you tired more than usual? Do you find yourself just tense, right? Even if it's like, I wasn't even doing anything and my muscles just hurt. Um, easily annoyed or overly reactive. You know, we that gets a bad rap. Like you're so sensitive, um, but consider, is that a cue of mine that things start to bother me and get to me more than they usually do? Do I start isolating? Or do I become clingy and need to be around people more than usual? What are my spiritual cues? Do I have a hard time engaging um, with, with the church members? And do I find myself missing services more than I usually do? No. Again, God has given us these amazing bodies that's always talking to us. We need to learn how to listen. 
We need to learn how to listen and know what our body is telling us that we need. And then consequently go back to that toolbox and pull something out or go get a new tool and implement them so that you can take care of yourself and hopefully have some of these cues start to, to reduce. Anybody see anything here that's like, yeah, that's a clear indicator for me. I see some heads nodding. Yeah, most of us know our cues if we're honest, right? Like when I ask clients this, I always laugh when they're like, I don't think I have any cues. You have cues. <laughs> you know when you're getting on that, that crispy side. So pay attention and listen and take it serious because remember that continuum we talked about, right? If I keep ignoring these cues, what happens? I'm pushing myself further and further up that continuum. And now it's no longer just reactivity. Now there's a chronic and long lasting irritability or depressed mood and things like that. So now we're starting to go further up and then you know, we're gonna need to get uh, more significant support in that area. So I'm gonna start closing with this is that we're all unique. You know, God has divined us and with fear and wonder and we're all uh, created in a way that's unique to do a unique work in the earth. And so how you take care of yourself will also be unique. And there's nothing I can encourage the most and this, and I find myself saying this more and more in the days of social media is be careful about comparing yourself. Be careful about wanting to do things because someone else is doing it. And, and I should be, should is always what I say, my red flag. There is no should. How you take care of your mental health, your well-being, your spiritual health, your physical health is gonna be unique to you. So give yourself the gift of exploring and finding that. Like if you've been listening to me today and you're like, oh my gosh, I kind of feel overwhelmed because I don't even know where to start. Start anywhere. Give yourself the gift of exploring until you figure out what that looks like. It's not a race. <laughs> it's not a, we're not arriving somewhere. This is a continual process. Okay. Thank you all so much. And I'm looking at time because I was like, please don't go over Sharon. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for letting me share this with you. And I hope that you got something practical that you can implement right away. And if you have any questions or thoughts, I'm open for that as well.